afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Intel Ireland Thought Leadership Lecture. Please be advised that this session will be recorded. Our event today is hosted by Professor Yvonne Galligan, Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at TU Dublin, in conversation with Sinead Burke, CEO of Tilting the Lens and Disability Advocate. If you have any queries, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Now, the president of TU Dublin, Professor David Fitzpatrick, will say a few words. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the second Intel Thought Leadership Lecture hosted by TU Dublin. The first lecture of this series was delivered by Eamon Sinnott, Vice President of Intel's Technology and Manufacturing Group and the General Manager of Intel Ireland. In February 2019, at a celebration in Grange Gorman, to mark a multi-year partnership between our two organizations. Unfortunately, the series took a break in 2020 due to COVID-19, but I'm delighted to say that our second lecture features Professor Yvonne Galligan, Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion here in TU Dublin, in conversation with Sinead Burke, CEO of Tilting the Lens and Disability Advocate. Yvonne and Sinead will discuss how we create an inclusive world together. And their conversation will focus on the structural nature of inclusion or exclusion rather, where inequalities are the product of cultural norms, historical legacies and unquestioned practices and policies. Their conversation will show the importance of an aware collective leadership being open to new questions, fresh perspectives and innovative solutions. Ahead of the main event, I would like once again to thank Intel Ireland for their ongoing engagement, commitment and contribution to TU Dublin, and in particular for their support in hosting and contributing to the Intel Thought Leadership event today. I look forward very much to our hosting the third lecture in person next year and to being able to physically welcome you all to TU Dublin. At this point, I will hand you over to Professor Yvonne Galligan and wish you all a very enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you, David, and uh, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, Sinead, lovely to be in conversation with you. Um, Sinead, we're going to be speaking uh, about leadership from awareness to action, creating an inclusive world together. And um, our focus is looking at how we become change makers for equity, diversity and inclusion, and how we get to the point where everyone is valued for their talents and irrespective of ability, identity or social context, can use these talents in a way that is fulfilling for the person and of benefit to society as a whole. So before we get into that discussion, Sinead, Perhaps we can dwell on the life experiences that has led us to champion equality and inclusion. So what have been the, the particular experiences that have brought you down that path? Yvonne, thank you so much for such a brilliant introduction to this conversation. I'm conscious that for those who are participating in this dialogue, it's evening time for some, if you're in Ireland like us. So this can be a bit of a heavy subject. But before we go any further, thinking about equality, equity, inclusion and access, I wanted to briefly start with a visual description of myself. So my name is Sinead. I'm a white cisgendered woman who uses the pronouns she and her. I am visibly and physically disabled. I have dwarfism, which may not actually be that evident on a Zoom call. It's possibly the only place in the world in which it is not so evident, but I stand at the height of three feet, five inches tall. I have brown hair that cascades past my shoulders and is edging just a little bit long, thanks to the continued pandemic. And I have brown eyes, and today I'm wearing a black roll neck jumper, and I'm sitting in front of a teal colored virtual background. And I think in many ways, that visual description hints to some of those life experiences that I have engaged with and had forever that has led me to this moment. 
I think those of us who are invested in this work around inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility is often due to a physical touch point that we have to understanding what success and what agency looks like in this space. As a physically disabled woman, as someone who acquired this disability at birth, who had no hand, act or part in choosing this disability, the quest for accessibility, the quest for equity was fundamental to my own independence and agency. I think it was at the very earliest of ages that I was very knowledgeable and aware of the fact that my experience was rooted in the fact that I lived in a world that was not designed for me. And that was not necessarily out of maliciousness, but out of structural challenges and biases that existed that we only designed a world for a few. I think when I was much younger, I thought that I was the only person in the world who the world wasn't designed for. But due to that experience of being a disabled person, really began to engage in broader conversations with lots of other communities who experienced that challenges too. And I think the other part of my identity and my work that has shaped the lived experience, hopefully to be part of this conversation, though not really sure I'm qualified enough to be in a conversation around thought leadership. So I'm going to borrow and lean on you here, Yvonne, for that. But my background is also that I'm an educator. And I think that has been fundamental to my journey within this space, because every conversation and project and work that I engage in is with the starting point of we don't know what we don't know. And I fundamentally believe that it is education, whether that happens in a third level institution like TU Dublin, whether that happens at home around a dining room table, in a primary school classroom or just among friends, that education is the catalyst by which we create systemic, sustainable change. Because the more exposure that we can have to different lived experiences, the more that we can empower ourselves to be curious and to be accountable for all that we do not know, the more that we can begin to use tools individually and collectively to create that change. And I think it is both that curiosity that is shaped by my lived experience and my identity of being a disabled woman and my career and expertise as a teacher that has really formulated the tools and the pathway that I'm currently involved in to try to create a bit of change. I hope that makes sense. That makes a huge amount of sense, uh, Sinead, and, uh, and really creates an inspiring um, uh, template for all of us to follow and to consider and reflect on um, on what it is that brings us all to this conversation today, not just you and I, but everybody that's participating here in this uh, conversation, and also reflect on each of our own uh, degrees of agency, both within our backgrounds and also within our current situations. So for example, um, um, when, when I uh, was growing up as a young girl, it was very clear to me that, um, that boys had the exciting lives and girls were expected to have the more modest life, the more understated kind of life, almost a lesser life. Um, we were to be the understudies and the supports and certainly not to outshine the boys and the men in the world. And, and that was certainly an experience that, uh, that I internalized at a very early age and took quite some time to uh, understand that this was not how the world should be. It certainly was not the way I wanted the world to be. Um, and yet at the same time, um, I was very conscious that in the part of rural Ireland where I grew up, um, that um, many of my friends saw their father once a year uh, when their father came home for uh, holidays or whatever. And I was very fortunate, first of all, to have my father in my life, but secondly, also to be able to see him every day of the week. And, uh, and so those combinations of very early lived experiences um, and, and a desire to kind of break out of the constraints that, um, that, that enveloped women's lives and girls' lives were the things that led me to enter the education world 
and to uh, study and to write books around this uh, kind of question and issue. And as you say, education is very much a key to exploring and opening and understanding. But I interrupted you because I well, know you come back. Not at all, but I, I think you're touching on something that's so important, which is about representation, visibility, role models, but also the idea that when we think about exclusion or if we think about inclusion, so much of that symbolism is often invisible to us or is inherited or acquired based on culture or community. And it's funny you raise these things. You know, I was born in 1990. I was born a couple of months before Mary Robertson became the first female president of Ireland. But for all of my life, I probably wasn't as aware of the fact that she was the first female president of Ireland, just that she was the president of Ireland. And then came Mary McAleese, and then came President Michael D. Higgins. And I remember being slightly amused when it was announced that Michael D. Higgins was becoming president, because I was like, oh, I didn't know a man could do that job, because my whole lived experience was that a woman was president and lived in Aris and Uthron. And that is quite a privileged existence to have lived within those decades. And now, of course, the irony in being able to sit on the Council of State and holding that incredibly fortunate and wonderful position. But it goes back to what you were saying that, you know, if we can see it, we can be it. And I think for so many people who have a lived experience of exclusion, regardless of what identity group that you fit into, so much of that exclusion is often based on the lack of role models, the lack of visibility and just not knowing that that space, whatever you dream of being or existing within, is actually possible. Uh, indeed, uh, Sinead, you're quite right. And sometimes it can actually um, uh, be quite tiring, even though one may be using one's agency and one's capacity for change. It's not always easy to be the one person calling out inequality or calling out discriminatory behavior. In a way, it's, it's a big burden for the individual to carry, either the individual that is the subject of, of uh, a particular um, inequality or discrimination, or indeed an individual who is being an ally and mm -hmm. is constantly wishing to um, draw attention to uh, the, the, the injustice that's happening. So, so while there's a really important um, question around people having a mindset that's supportive of inclusion. There's also something around um, doing this collectively, doing this in a structured way that I think is also important. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on that question. I think you're absolutely right. If we are looking to solutions, we need to come to this from an individual, collective and structural approach, because I think the barriers to access agency and dignity are often individual, collective and structural. You know, you spoke earlier on about living in rural Ireland and what that experience was like for you. And I think when we talk about the challenges that face us, it's really important that we look to it in those terms, because if we only ever look at it through an individual lens, that places the responsibility and the obligation on the individual almost to assimilate, to fit in, rather than asking community, culture, society to transform and change for a growing diversity of a population. And I think when we look at those different systems, so whether that system is family, and then moving outside kind of in almost concentric circles, looking at family, looking at community, looking at culture, looking at industry, then looking at politics and governance, looking at wider society and then kind of international biases. We are so shaped by each of those systems that we live and work within. You were talking to, you know, even being at school, when you were younger and what the gender norms and gender roles that you were supposed to fit into. Thankfully, some of those have changed, not all of them. But when we look at identity more broadly, and then looking at intersectionality, which is the language and rhetoric that the incredible academic Kimberly Crenshaw talked mm -hmm. to about the intersections of identity, about how identities cross over one another and how that creates even further challenges around oppression or lack of access or lack of agency, but can also then when there is, you know, a normative within an identity, boost the access that others have. So I think if we 
want to whiteboard solutions that are short term and long term. Looking at this as a collective approach is really important. And even if we're just to take disability as a case study or as an example for the moment, why it's important to look at this as a collective and structural opportunity is because disability is the only identity group that we will each access at one point in our lives. Because disability can be permanent or it can be transient in the fact that you may leave the place where you're currently biding in and fall or trip, I hope you don't. And for a period of time, you will be in a cast or you will have to navigate the world through crutches. And I also hope that we all age and we all get to live in a world that is better designed for older people because the same innovation opportunities that will help a wheelchair user will also help an older person who's using a mobility device or a parent who's using a buggy or a stroller. And I think if we look at the opportunities that could come about if we had collective activism around accessibility and disability, it would not just be benefiting the one in five people that the, that the census says are disabled, but actually building a better world for all of us as we age. So even if we look at collective activism as something that is self-serving, there is more than one rationale for us coming together to that. And it's also that realization that if we are constantly relying on the one individual to advocate for themselves, going back to your question, what does that cost? Mm -hmm. What does that cost the ordinary individual who is so tired of not being able to rent a home? Because like me, they may not be able to reach the lock on the whole door, or they may not be able to reach the light switches or they may not be able to enter the upstairs because that's where the bathroom is because they have a physical disability. Or what about if you are an autistic person and you would like a job in a supermarket, but actually due to the lights and the sounds and the sensory activities that happen in a space like that, you can't be employed there. It feels so tiresome to just exist. Mm -hmm. And advocacy is often dependent on the parts of our lives that we just need in order to be, per be there as a person. So whether that's employment, whether that's education, whether that's dignity and public access of spaces, that actually we haven't even gotten to the point of advocating for entertainment, for enjoyment, for you know, hobbies and pastimes. And actually by collective advocacy, by addressing the systemic barriers and the systemic injustices that continue to exist for lots of communities, we can actually create a world and a community where everybody feels safe and everybody feels welcome to just show up as themselves and to bring those ideas and innovations and perspectives to work, to enjoyment, to Ireland. And indeed, Sinead, they uh, point about systemic injustices um, is, is a very relevant one and is also one that is backed up by many uh, uh, evidenced reports now. So, for example, um, a report uh, this year from the OECD found that people with disabilities in Ireland had a 35% employment rate, which was half that of the non-disabled population. And we are among the lowest of all countries in the EU for the employment of persons with disabilities. Um, a report from the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission in 2019, just before COVID, uh, found that the employment rate for travellers was a shocking 80%. The, unemployed, the, the unemployment rate for travellers was a shocking 80% compared with 13% of the working age population. And uh, in terms of uh, African nationals, only 45% of African nationals are in employment compared to 70% for other national uh, minority national groups. And then when you take those, these are only three examples, but you take those and you bring the intersectionality into play. Intersectionality of gender, for example. So women belonging to all the communities that I have just mentioned now experience even more discrimination, experience even uh, less access to the labor market. 
as one institution uh, that, that uh, uh, we have in our society. So, so I have to say to myself, why is this? Why is this happening? And I think to myself, it's because of the customs and the rules, both written and unwritten, and largely unwritten, that we live by. And we just take this for granted in our world. And I guess I worry about how long we have to wait for change to come about, for that 35% to become 85% or 95%, um, for that uh, only 20% uh, employment rate for travelers to, to become a 95% employment rate for travelers or 100% employment rate. What do we have to do? to bring this about. We just can't sit back and do nothing. I think what's been really interesting in the pandemic is that for, well, since time immemorial, the disabled community have been asking the world of work to transfer to a hybrid model, to permit working from home as a way in which to be productive, as a way in which to be gainfully employed. The world of work said, impossible. It would never be able to happen. The security issues, everybody would be, you know, not working. They would be in their pajamas. They wouldn't be doing anything. And then we had a pandemic. And overnight, because the majority of non-disabled people needed to work and needed to not be in an office, we found structures and policies and practice by which working from home was immediately possible. So what was once impossible for one community then became the norm because the majority needed it. Again, going back to the need for collective access. But what we are seeing coming out of the pandemic, although the pandemic has not ended, particularly here in a space like Ireland where our case numbers are incredibly high still, but what we are seeing is this demand and expectation to be back and physically present. That the learnings that we took from the pandemic about access, about the necessity of having sign language interpreters available at events, the necessity of having materials available in plain language and in multiple languages, not just English, Irish, and ISL. We are ridding ourselves of those learned behaviors, which have actually created employment opportunities, which has actually created agency and independence for so many disabled people. We have now deprioritized those activities as we go back to what is building back better and the new norm. And some of that, is because our physical spaces are not designed for or with disabled people to enter into them with access or with agency. And that's not just specific to disabled people. That's also relevant to the trans community. That's also relevant to the traveler community, as you mentioned, and also relevant to communities like the Muslim community, because most workspaces maybe don't have areas where an individual can safely pray in particularly periods of the day. So we need to rethink how we go back to work. And if we don't do it now, we may never have another opportunity wherein we can reset the status quo and explicitly invite different communities to be present and to be engaging in our workplace. And I think that intentionality about how we include people has never been more important. And at a time in which there is so much on and we are so concerned, it is gonna be so easy for us to forget that requirement, but it must be integral and essential to it. And I think there are easier ways in which we can do it. Again, from a disability perspective, we can begin to find practices that rid us of the ableism that exists within us. So for example, if you're in a HR position and if a CV comes across your desk and there is a period of time in which that person was out of work, it is standard practice that you cast that CV aside without asking any additional questions. But that person might have a chronic illness. Hey, they may have had COVID and we provide no opportunity to ask a follow-up question, but we rule them out because they don't fit our standard of what we believe a working person needs to be. I'm currently trying to hire an executive assistant and I've been doing nothing but looking at multiple job descriptions that exist in order to compare and contrast from what I need. One of the key points that comes up in almost every job description is a good telephone manner. <laughs> I'm like, how would that work for a person who is deaf, 
or has low hearing or a person who is autistic or a person who doesn't speak English as a first language. There are so many other ways in which we can measure communication or maybe that method of communication is not the most viable one. But yet how we define a person who is able to work intentionally using able there with an ableist tilt of my tone of voice, it's shaping how we do that. And I think if we look at it from even a business case, you know, we often talk about the spending power of disabled people being 1.7 trillion US dollars per annum. But what we're missing out on here is also the innovation, the creativity, and also the opportunity to scale our businesses. You know, Forbes says that any business that is prioritizing accessibility has an opportunity of investment of up to $10 billion within the next three years, because that is the need of accessibility in physical and digital spaces, in products and services over the next short term period. But it's also about innovation. Again, from a disability perspective, disabled people are engineers by design because we have to spend all of our lives living in a world that is not designed for us, that we are naturally solution oriented because if I have to go about a university campus, if I have to go about a technology campus, I will do so much research in advance to figure out how I get there, what time I need to show up on. But in the same way that because I've been constantly altering my clothes or because I've been constantly trying to figure out how to get into a space, I have natural solutions that are innovative by design that non-disabled people don't ever have to think about. So why would you not open the doors of your business to be able to welcome in those innovations and ideas because they will make your products, your services, your company culture all the more creative for it. And you asked, how do we do this? How do we not wait? I think often we again place the expectation on disabled people, on those who are from a diverse community or those who have a lived experience with exclusion. We place the responsibility on them because we say, well, you know, we put a job description out there and nobody applied. But do you also say in the job description that should it be needed, a sign language interpreter will be available for interview? Do you detail how physically accessible or how sensory accessible your space is? So that as a little person, I don't have to email you and say, hi, I think it's really great that you have a job available. I just wanted to check, would it be a big deal if when I get there, you could have a footstool? Should I bring it with me? Other people don't have to go through that they don't have to contort themselves to just make it to the baseline standard. And I think we really need to place the responsibility on organizations, be that educational bodies or be that the world of work to do better in bridging the gap so that people themselves can just show up and equitably participate in the process. Indeed, uh, Sinead, and it's not about asking the individual to fit. It's about making sure that the circumstances the situation and the conditions are ones that enable that individual to participate as fully as the next person. And just before you answer, uh, Sinead, I've just noticed that um, we have a question from our audience or maybe a comment. So I'm going to go to uh, Lisa Saputo, who is moderating the chat for us on this conversation. So Lisa, maybe you can come in with the comment yeah. or question. Sure. Um, so we have one question for Sinead. Um, so Sinead has been a vocal advocate for a number of years. Has she seen any progress in Ireland in the area of inclusion? That's a great question. And thank you yeah. so much. I think we have seen some progress. If we think about employment, if we think about accessibility, what we have seen is organizations and other disability advocates. If we look at the work that, for example, As I Am is doing around ensuring that spaces are more inclusive to autistic people. If we look at government initiatives like Employers for Change, which are trying to find equitable pathways for disabled people in employment, we are seeing change there. If we look at the transforming conversations that are happening around the visibility of disabled people, say around the Paralympics, for example, which happened this year, we are seeing more and more conversations around disability. We do have the UN Day for People with Disabilities coming up on December 3rd. We are seeing more organizations wanting to participate in that conversation. But I guess for me, one of my greatest friction points is often how do we move from awareness to action, which is exactly the title of this talk. How do we move from having a conversation around language, 
from allowing people to be comfortable saying the word disabled using identity first language, which is my preference, saying that I'm a disabled woman rather than a woman with a disability, which is person first language. How do we move from having that rhetoric and conversation to actually looking at what are the policies that are needed? How do we get disabled people employed and, and, and you know, elected to our doll? How do we get disability part of the core agenda of every policy issue going forward? Because I believe disability and accessibility is part of, of every issue. And I think we have lots of, again, to speak to systemic barriers that exist within that. And I think we need to be encouraging everybody to be asking questions such as, is this accessible? So whether you work for Irish Rail and you're thinking about new train stations and thinking about design of new trains, or whether you are designing a webinar <laughs> or whether you are going into a meeting or whether you are a student in a lecture and you realize that actually there isn't a sign language interpreter there, there isn't closed captioning or that somebody disabled is not able to participate in the way in which you are. What are the ways in which we are constantly bringing this to the core of our attention? So I do think there has been some changes, but I think, again, if we look to the intersectionality of disability more broadly, there is so much work to do. If I could recommend you to read Dr. Rosaline McDonough's book, which is just so insightful about the experiences of being a woman, being a traveler woman and being a disabled woman. If I can recommend that you follow Susie Byrne, Alana Murray, there are so many disability advocates, disabled women of Ireland. Those are perspectives that we need to bring to the fore and not just have conversations around disability that fit in the parameters of inspiration porn or something that is very specific and tied to just one calendar moment in the year. So I think there is progress, but I am a person who knows that any progress that happens immediately is purely for publicity and marketing purposes. And we are trying to rewrite a trajectory that has been embedded in this country since it began. We still, in some parts of our country, exist within a charitable model when it comes to disability. We still rely on charities to provide government services. And that's a real barrier. We still have a benefits trap where many disabled people, some based on capacity legislation, don't have the agency to have sex, don't have the agency to get married, depending on their disability. We still have you know, challenges around if you work too many hours, you then lose your medical card, which then means you can't afford to be healthy or well or to keep up with your medication that's required for your chronic illness or your disability. So there are still so many systemic barriers and what we are seeing is some short term solutions that are creating change, but this needs to be grassroots and grass top in order for it to exist forever. Um, but it is all of our responsibility to do more. And I, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's not a simple quick fix. Um, and the uh, institutions and the organizations you mention, and all our institutions and our organizations are really about people and people working in a collective environment. And in a way, we need in those environments to have meaningful conversations about inclusion. Conversations that don't necessarily focus on uh, an individual's blame, uh, blame as an individualized thing, but look at the collective fault of exclusion, um, which is something that as individuals, we are all part of creating, but we are not exclusively uh, to blame for creating, but we are, we need to find collective ways of being inclusive. And I think a good example of, uh, of a collective reflection on the wrongs of the past is our current national conversation on the forced incarceration of pregnant young women right up to the 1980s, mm. forced adoption in many, many cases of their children. And now as a society, we are trying collectively to make amends for that terrible wrong. And it's a difficult conversation. I mean, these are not simple feel good um, chats over a cup of coffee to be meaningful. These are things that make us both individually and collectively search into our own hearts and be very honest and be very courageous within ourselves.
But to me, that's what leadership is about. <laughs> Having to explore why we exclude, why we marginalize, and then collectively do something to right that wrong. So I'm just wondering what your response to that thought might be. These conversations are so difficult, but never has this country, I believe, in my opinion, been more ready for these conversations. You know, if we look to the previous two referendums that have been recently held in this country, it is my belief that those referendums were decided upon, not by debates that were had in government buildings, but led by human conversations in homes, in WhatsApp groups, in iMessage threads, in one-to-one -one conversations over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, where it was human stories and the power of empathy and vulnerability that changed hearts and minds. That required a lot of advocacy from the country as a whole. And in many ways is probably one of the reasons I'm proudest to be an Irish woman because I think, and to be an Irish person, because I think we have this collective empathy in that even if we don't often have the lived experience, of an issue that we are being asked to speak to, we can envisage and imagine what agency and choice will give to another. And we have in the past acted upon that. And I think for me, what's really interesting is like, what are the collective solutions? So we acknowledge that there are collective challenges, but what are the collective solutions? So if we even think about bathrooms, for example, I'm obsessed with bathrooms because I think they are just such a symbol mm. of access. They They're are, a basic human right. Yes, but they and two, they are they are an invitation and they are literally a clock for how long you are able to extend it, it, it be in a place. So, for example, if you are a physically disabled person and if there is no accessible bathroom, you can only be in that space for the length of time in which you need to go to the bathroom, and that is true too for a member of the trans community, if there is not a safe space for them to go to the bathroom. So if we began to open a broad question, if we partnered with Grafton architects who are the best architects in the world, if we brought together a cohort of people with lived experience from the trans and disabled communities, the Muslim communities, those in direct provision and said, you know what, what would be the safest, most inclusive, most beautiful bathroom? What would it look like? What would you need? And whether that is the urinal, urinal pointing to Mecca, whether that is two different heights of toilets, whether that is three sinks, something that moves beyond what is the minimum standard to better practices. Gosh, what would that make a person feel if they were in a space where they didn't have to worry about the amount of time that they could spend or whether or not they would lose their dignity or have to have a difficult conversation with a stranger in order to just access the bathroom? And then if we think bigger than a bathroom, what does that look like from a door? What is a door that everybody can enter and exit without having to worry about friction or how, how strong they need to be? And these are things that are specifically physical, which means it's actually really easy to change because mm -hmm. culture, community, identity, the principles of society take longer. Whereas if we made a decision tomorrow that in Ireland, all of the bathrooms are going to be inclusive and equitable and accessible, that's quite the statement about who gets to belong here. And again, thinking about the, the different parts of the, the collective solutions, I recently spoke to someone who was in direct provision and they talked to me about this event that was set up that they were so excited to travel to. They traveled on a bus that took them two and a half hours, they got there. And when they arrived, security said, great, show us your ID. Mm -hmm. They didn't have photo ID because of the system that they have been put into. And was it necessary that that person needed photograph formalized ID in order to go to a social event that was about inclusion and was about equality? No, it was probably just a standard practice that we have lived with forever because it didn't affect us. But who else would benefit from not having to show formalized identity? That's probably the traveler community. That's probably the trans community. That's probably the disabled community. There are so many of us who can benefit from those collective solutions. And I think one of our real challenges to progress is that we've been so individual <laughs> in our attempt to create change that it is, what does this community need? What does that community need? It often comes down to who has the most resources, who has the loudest voice, who has the greatest voting power. 
Whereas actually, if we said, no, this needs to be everyone or no one. If we made decisions with everyone at the table, I know that's yeah. difficult and I know that may seem impossible, but with as many different perspectives as possible, change would be systemic. And I think you've hit the nail on the head that when designing these structures, uh, these frameworks or whatever it may be, these spaces, whatever it may be, that the voices of the people who uh, experience the disadvantage in yeah. that context, whatever that disadvantage may be, um, are their voices need to be heard at the table and need to be listened to very, very carefully. And sometimes I think that, <clears throat> that we kind of overlook the voice of the people or the group who are experiencing the, uh, the underrepresentation or the discrimination or the disadvantage in whatever shape it may be. And I think we need, to, so in order to change collectively, there also needs to be an element of humility and an element of listening involved in this process as well. I think when we imagine leadership, you know, my background is in education, as I was sharing, I'm a primary school teacher. I taught 12 year old boys in the inner city in Dublin. And I think when I began teaching, there was at least an internalized assumption that I had about what it meant to be a leader, what it meant to be a teacher. And it was usually somebody who was very tall. It was usually somebody who was white. It was usually a woman. She was usually from the West Coast of Ireland and spoke with, you know, Galway Irish. And she looked down on the classroom because of the height that she stood at. And that really challenged me about how I would be a teacher in that space. And the design of the classroom too. You know, my children used to sit in clusters. The tables were grouped by color, but that didn't work for me because standing at the top of the room, I couldn't see them and they couldn't see me. So I redesigned the classroom and sat the boys in a U shape and stood at the top of the room. And all of a sudden we were at eye level. It transformed the whole culture of the classroom where just by restructuring it, we created an element of equality and equity and that my leadership was rooted in respect, humility, vulnerability, and this idea that we needed to co-create this space together in order for it to be effective. And that has been transformative, but that the classroom is a microcosm. And actually doing mm -hmm. that in the wider world is a little bit more complex and challenging, but never has it been more essential. So what does that look like? And I think one of the other challenges that we need to address not just here in Ireland, but globally, is how we value lived experience. Going back to your point, that we often qualify expertise, particularly in an academic setting, as something that has much more value than somebody's lived experience. But that too should be measured and weighted as an expertise, because it is. And it cannot be often gained from a book or a study, but is essential to the development of that research and study. And when we then measure those things equally, humility is required because as somebody who briefly participated in a PhD program, it takes a huge amount of work, time, tenacity, commitment, resources to be able to acquire that academic positioning and not just academia, but in work too. But we have to hold the same weight for lived experience. But then often when, even if we do that philosophically, it means that we are not addressing the systemic barriers that exist. Because if we take, say, disabled people, for example, they may be on disability benefit. And for them to participate in a workshop, in a session that is about creating a policy, that is about, you know, transforming a company culture, for them to be there for three hours, they may not be on the salary in the same way in which we measure expertise from a work and academic perspective. So even if we wait that lived experience in the same way as expertise and count them as universal. We have to address the systemic barriers because going back to where we started this conversation, often we place the burden on the individual to solve the problem. And the reward is that the problem is solved rather than valuing their participation and just all that they brought to the process too. And I, we need to value that in, in economic ways. We need to value that in cultural ways. We need to find opportunities to bring them into our work, into our academic programs, 
in order for this not just to be something that we entertain once in a while when we get a notion that we should include diverse voices. And uh, Sinead, I noticed that uh, we have uh, yet another uh, question coming through. So I'm going to bring Lisa in again to voice that question or comment. Thank you. Um, so in the context of e EDI, what advice would you give to a fellow educator about expressing personal opinions on an issue such as the Me Too movement that may upset many of their students? That may upset many of their students. I think that is difficult. As somebody who taught in a classroom, there were often topics that came up culturally that would be different to the opinions that were held in the classroom. And actually sometimes, which was even more complicated in the staff room, right? Because sometimes, at least in my experience, having conversations with children, there was greater curiosity. There was greater appetite to explore the points made on either ends of the spectrum of opinion than there would be by the opinions that were firmly held by the adults in the staff room. I think it's about providing a rationale. So, you know, I'm assuming that if you're talking about Me Too, that potentially your opinion is about, you know, sexism, it's about gender, it's about the treatment of people of different genders, regardless of where they sit on the spectrum of gender, not just a binary and what that looks like. And I think the way in which you can have those conversations is often through personal narratives. So when we were trying to explore some of the most complex conversations in my classroom, we would often do it through storytelling because it feels like a more comfortable place of introduction and beginning. So not that this is the same issue, but I taught fifth class girls in Ballymun and really wanted to have a conversation around community, class and gender. And although they were far too old for this text, it was a very large picture book called Christie's Dream. And Christie was a young boy who loved riding around a horse in the middle of Ballymun. And all of the illustrations were about Ballymun. It was the first time that they had ever seen their locality reflected in a published book. And what I wanted to draw from this was not necessarily the text of the book itself, but wanted to draw conversations around representation, misrepresentation, how that made them feel, what exclusion looked like to be an 11 year old girl in that area and what the opportunities were to do more. And I think for me, it's about framing the conversation with questions and then adding in points of view and perspectives from different participants. So I would leverage TED Talks. I would leverage multimedia opportunities that feel consumable because I think often particularly if you are closely connected to an issue, right? I am a disability advocate by choice and by birth, both in terms of the home that I grew up in and just the body that I live in. And there are certain topics around disability, probably more personally connected than anything more, that I begin to talk about it. And I can't think straight because I'm so emotionally, personally connected to an issue that actually getting my point across just creates more friction. So I often find that if I can take a step back and if I can enter the dialogue through another person's world, it gives me a small bit of distance to be able to be a bit more measured and to be able to facilitate conversations that if I was so emotionally connected, I may take as malicious rather than curious. And I think as an educator, being able to be in that grounded place where you can navigate it, almost use Socratic dialogue, which is what Socrat which is what Socrates did. And he would often say, and why, and why? And I often find that methodology really great to dissolve opinions that may be more challenging and more problematic to then provide evidence and stories and first-hand narratives that maybe feel a little bit more equitable and fair. And that's uh, that's really great, uh, um, Sinead, that also uh, tells us that um, that in a way we should not be, we need, should not expect perfection from ourselves uh, every time that this is that continuous practice gets us to where we need to be rather than expecting it to be the perfect answer the perfect solution perfect whatever but i noticed that i think lisa's hand is still up so uh, lisa are you coming in with another question now thanks so one um there's lots of comments come, coming through people saying they're loving the conversation <laughs> so um, you don't have to lie to us lisa it's fine <laughs> um, somebody's asked uh, it's a great point around the last referendums and they'd like to know how inclusion and accessibility 
will become part of the nat uh, national conversation. And they've also asked, how do we prevent things going backwards after the pandemic? It's a great question. In thinking about how do we make accessibility and disability part of the national conversation, I do think there are some continued efforts being made if we look at the planning and the process that's that's happening around, say, the redesign of the Phoenix Park and the access to the Phoenix Park. Conversations around accessibility have been core to that dialogue, even just using that as an example. But I think it's about consultation processes, making sure again that different experiences are in the room. And I think it's also about lionizing non-disabled allies, that the next time you vote, the next time you, I don't know, go to a coffee shop or go to a nightclub before the curfew, ask, is your venue accessible? The next time you're making a lunch booking or a dinner booking, inquire. And then prioritize spaces that are accessible and whether that's physically accessible or whether that's accessible to those with sensory challenges. I think unless everyone is prioritizing accessibility, it will only be the requirement of those of us who need it now. Again, understanding that we will all need it. There was a second question, Lisa, that I have completely forgotten. Would you mind reminding me of it? That was, how do we prevent things going backwards after the pandemic? I really think it's about addressing our language first and foremost. So if you look at the statistics in the UK, six out of every 10 COVID deaths in the UK were disabled people. That is a startling figure, six mm. out of 10. And those are people with chronic illnesses. Those are people with physical disabilities. Those are older people. What we are seeing more and more is rhetoric around, particularly as our case numbers increase. Yeah, but did they have underlying conditions? Were they vulnerable? Can we just address for a second what we're actually asking there? Because what that language is equating to is, yeah, but they weren't real people. Like they had underlying conditions. Like, what do you expect? Of course they were going to die. Whose lives do we value? Whose deaths or survival are more important or are worth more? And we fall into this pattern of using language like underlying conditions, vulnerable. We expect those who are disabled or have chronic illnesses or who are more vulnerable just to isolate themselves so the rest of us can get back to work, so the rest of us can get back to life and get back to socializing. Gosh, I understand the need and the want to do that. I understand how hard the isolation is. But if that rhetoric is becoming part of our patterns of behavior and culture and norms now, when does it change? Because this mirrors what has happened in the past is that when disabled people were historically born into families and homes, we called them a burden. We had sympathy for the families and we institutionalized disabled people. We took them out of their homes and out of their communities, which is why now we live in cities where there are no ramps, where there are no consideration of access because disabled people didn't live there. They were in care homes and institutions. It has been so long to move us back into a period of disabled people having agency, having rights, having dignity. That we are at risk of not doing that. And I think it's a very small step, but if we started with our language and started talking about disabled people differently, talking to disabled people, not talking about them at all, and amplifying their voices, we would be in a different position moving forward. And uh, Sinead, indeed, um, uh, we are coming uh, towards the end of our time uh, together, but it strikes me that in, in just uh, one last thought around this, uh, wrapping all of this up, it seems to me that if we have an individual mindset for change and a collective awareness of and interrogation of our mm -hmm. informal practices and assumptions, that that could all be wrapped up in the word about think about the impact our assumptions and our behavior has on the other not about what we intend it to be but about what the actual impact is yeah. on the uh, whomever the individual the group the element of society that is being excluded um, that i think that might help us 
shift uh -huh. the dial a little bit around all of this so uh -huh. that become a little more thoughtful around these things and exactly as you said to kind of wrap up you know these practices can be very large in thinking about who we vote for and how accessible our parliament buildings are but they can also be small in like the next time as we were talking about you make a booking in a restaurant asking about accessibility or that you say to yourself you know what on social media from now on if i post a story to instagram that is a video i'm going to make sure it's captioned or if i post a photo to my feed on Instagram, I'm gonna make sure that there's an image description or there's alt text, because I wanna make sure that anybody who uses a screen reader can engage with that content in the same way as everyone else. And that's really personal. You can choose to do those things right now. It will take a little bit of time and effort and it'll be challenging at the beginning, but become norm forevermore. But even if everybody on this call decided to do that, it would change tomorrow. And I think the other thing that I would ask you to do is that, I'm very conscious, Yvonne, that when you and I come together, you know, and we can see it with the questions that are being asked, the people who are here are probably already close to, if not embedded in this mindset that we are talking to. But there are people who are not here who are so distant from that mindset that actually they are the ones we need to really have conversations with and change. So what I would ask you to do is that when you leave this call, go and find somebody. <laughs> whether it is a friend, whether it is a family member, whether it is a colleague tomorrow and say, hey, I learned this thing yesterday. No, it's probably not from me. It's probably from Yvonne or from Michael. Because if we keep these conversations and if we keep these commitments to creating action to ourselves, to those of us who are already thinking in this way, it is going to take forever to move that employment rate from 35% to 75 and Sinead, thank you. This has been a fascinating discussion. Time is catching up with us, unfortunately. So reluctantly, I must stop our conversation here and hand over to Robert Wright, who is Ireland Director of Public Affairs for Intel. Robert. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sinead uh, and Yvonne, for such a, an engaging and an interesting and very touching conversation. Um, I think, you know, it's been a great event. It, it's such a thought provoking conversation. We could hear not just your own experience, Sinead, here, but also I'm hoping that the conversation and, and the story that you've told will help enable all the other voices to be heard and allow, allow others as well to share their experience and perspectives, as you said there at the end. What an amazing advocate you are, Sinead. Really, really fantastic. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit towards the end here. <clears throat> I'm so happy to be here on behalf of Eamon Synod and Intel Ireland. Uh, you know, I just rejoined uh, Intel after a 12 year pause uh, just about five weeks ago, and I couldn't be happier that this is the first event on this topic that I'm speaking at. Uh, I learned an awful lot from the conversation um, and like like me, I hope you're all feeling positive and energized by, by what you've heard. I think, you know, one of the things that struck me is that the leadership model that Sinead and Yvonne have explored and talked about is really a collective one. That's one of the key things that came across for me was the collectivity of this. At the heart of your exchange is the question, how can we, do, how can we do together deliver on an inclusive and e egalitarian culture? Also great that Sinead, you reminded us that this is a win-win opportunity for us all, not just a challenge. Based on today's conversation, I think, Let's challenge ourselves to think and lead inclusively and to do so collectively. I think we need to meet these challenges with collective solutions, as you said, Sinead. I just before closing wanted to say a few words on, on why inclusion is so important to Intel Ireland. I think, you know, it's good to, to remind everybody and, and we do so at Intel as much as we can in every day, that inclusion is one of Intel's core values. It's actually at the heart of our culture. We value diversity and we embrace differences. We build inclusive teams where everyone does their best work, celebrates and has fun together in an inclusive and empowering atmosphere. And we care and make a difference to each other and also the communities in which we work. But you know, it's not just enough to talk about these things, we need to act on them as well. And at Intel, we do offer many employee resource groups and leadership councils that connect over 25,000 of our employees. Connecting employees through our forums, groups, training, events, and mentoring programs 
has also been a long-standing hallmark of Intel's culture. And as it happens this week, in fact, Intel, we at Intel Ireland, we are actually holding our inclusion conference. So it's very nice parallel timing with this event indeed. Um, just this week, you know, we have external speakers, including Niall Breslin, Breslin, who's sharing his mental health journey, finding peace in the chaos of a modern world. Uh, we have Paralympians Ellen, Ellen Keane and Jason Smith, who are also sharing their stories, very personal and relevant stories. And we have an opportunity for our employees as well at this conference to share their stories. So I just really wanted to say thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the participants. Thank you, Sinead, Yvonne, to the political leaders present and to the participants for your valued questions and comments. Thank you all again.